Okay, so welcome back for the last talk before the last panel session on the last day of this workshop. And we're very happy to have Monica Pate uh, from Harvard who will tell us about celestial amplitudes from UV to IR. Okay, so uh, thanks. Um, let me begin by just thanking the organizers. This has been a really interesting and well-organized uh, conference. Um, so yeah, so what I'm gonna be talking about today um, are mainly uh, the results um, from this paper that uh, appeared uh, last December that I wrote um, with several collaborators, Nima Arkani Hamed, uh, Anna Rakaryu, and Andy Strominger. And uh, basically uh, what it does is it uh, begins a preliminary investigation uh, into the uh, UV and uh, uh, IR aspects um, of celestial amplitudes. Now, uh, before I uh, dive into this talk, uh, let me, um, I'd like to make just a brief one slide uh, digression and say a few words on uh, what I'm more currently been thinking about, uh, some of which has appeared uh, in this uh, recent paper uh, that I wrote with um, two other collaborators, uh, Mina Hemwich and Kyle Sang. And so uh, what we did here is that we showed that actually uh, Poincaré symmetry uh, can be used to fix the leading OP coefficients between massless non-primaries of any spin. And so sort of this is our uh, main result. And so the idea is that if you have two operators of, of, of a particular spin, there's a fusion rule for the leading um, polymorphic singularity, which tells you which uh, third operator can appear. And uh, the spin that's allowed to appear, which is S3, uh, can be related to the bulk uh, dimension of the three-point coupling uh, in 4D. And uh, these are the operator product uh, coefficients and M is labeling the conformal descendants. And so in particular, we have not just the primary ones, but of course the ones that, are, but the ones that are also the global conformal uh, primary descendant, uh, global conformal descendant uh, coefficients. And the second thing we did is that we also constructed uh, celestial currents um, from light transforms of conformally soft gravitons that generate the action of this uh, W1 plus infinity. And uh, so in particular, this is their action on massless null and primaries. And so the Q, Q is uh, labeling um, the different currents and is labeling the modes. And so the Q equals three halves and two are the form the Poincaré symmetry, so those were used to fix this, but you can show that the infinite tower um, of symmetries are also uh, respected by these operator product coefficients. And you've already heard a little bit about this um, in Hong Leong Jung's uh, really nice talk on uh, Tuesday and also in uh, his paper. Okay, so uh, now let me uh, back up and give a little bit of an introduction uh, for the talk that gets into uh, today's uh, theme in this celestial workshop. And so I think uh, the motivation for this program is really or, or our overarching goal is to add to our understanding of quantum gravity. And a prevailing idea is the idea of holography, which is that in order to understand quantum gravity, we don't like in particular need a whole lot of new ideas, but rather that Quantum gravity can in fact be described by known frameworks, such as quantum field theory, for example, provided that we find an appropriate recasting um, in terms of a holographic the dual theory. And so if we think about it this way, then really the challenge of holography or the challenge of quantum gravity is simply finding and justifying this dual theory. And so uh, the scattering problem and asymptotically, uh, the scattering problem is a natural question in uh, quantum gravitational theories and asymptotically flat space times. And it readily admits a holographic interpretation. And so to see this, first, the data that characterizes the scattering problem resides in a slightly different space than the gravitational theory. Namely, the scattering data is specified at the past and future boundaries of the space time where the gravitational effects are weak and perturbative. And second, um, the scattering data in 4D space times is organized by the symmetries, by symmetries which include uh, the global conformal symmetry of theories in two dimensions. And therefore we arrive at this idea that a 2D theory with conformal symmetry is a natural candidate for the holographic dual of quantum gravity in 4D asymptotically fast space times. Now, as we've heard throughout this conference to investigate the merits of this proposal, it's helpful to work in a basis in which 2D conformal symmetry is manifest. 
And since uh, the Lorentz symmetry SO3 comma one is isomorphic to SL2C, um, uh, the Lorentz symmetry is the 40 interpretation of the 2D global conformal symmetry. And therefore states which diagonalize a maximal number of the Lorentz generators will transform most simply under 2D global conformal symmetry. And so in particular, uh, we can diagonalize uh, one boost. So if you look at the Lorentz algebra, you can diagonalize one boost in the rotation uh, about, about the direction of that boost. And so therefore we should be studying uh, boost and helicity eigenstates. And as we've already seen, uh, boost and helicity eigenstates are related to momentum eigenstates by a change of basis. And so the simplest um, uh, change that you can do is to take a massless particle, parameterize it in terms of an energy and a point on the 2D sphere or 2D plane, and then Mellon transform with respect to that energy. And then celestial amplitudes are, represent the scattering of particles and boost eigenstates, and they're constructed, uh, for example, by Mellon transforming uh, each external massless particle with respect to its energy. And upon doing so, uh, one finds that the celestial amplitudes transform under Lorenz uh, like correlation functions of primary operators. And this supports the hope that quantum gravity and asymptotically flat spacetimes might be amenable to standard field theory techniques, but just applied to this auxiliary space, uh, which we're calling the celestial sphere. And so I think one of the like, you know, big questions we'd like to understand is we'd really like to know, you know, is this celestial conformal field theory a field theory? And this, as we've heard, seems to be a hard question. And so a more modest question is what are the implications of known field theoretic or possibly non-field theoretic behavior of 4D gravitational scattering amplitudes for celestial conformal field theory? And so why do we care about field theory behavior? Well, for one, it's a nice perturbative, it can be a nice perturbative framework. Uh, second, as we've heard more throughout today, uh, physical phenomena are known to be encoded in certain analytic behavior of field theories. And, and finally, uh, you know, field theory um, provides a framework that formalizes the decoupling of physics at long and short distances. Okay, uh, so the focus of this talk um, as I, I mentioned, will be the implications of known or assumed UV and I R behavior of 4D gravitational scattering amplitudes for celestial amplitudes. And so in particular, I'll be discussing uh, the effective field theory expansion, which will sort of nicely fill in um, uh, a part of the previous talk. And then um, the second thing I'll be discussing is uh, soft factorization and uh, curing infrared divergences in scattering amplitudes. And so, uh, in momentum space, uh, both of these aspects formalize the insensitiv insensitivity of low energy physics to the details of UV completion. And in particular, uh, these properties are manifest in a basis where we've diagonalized a maximal number of the Planck ray generators, so in other words, the four translations. And so it's natural to, to wonder how they appear in celestial amplitudes in which uh, we are choosing to uh, diagonalize a different set of the Planck ray generators. Okay, so the outline uh, for the rest of the talk is I'm going to uh, review the form of uh, the Poincaré constrained massless uh, scalar four point celestial amplitude uh, for Mellon primaries. And then I'm going to discuss how the effective field theory expansion or what the signature of the effective field theory expansion is in the celestial. Um, um, that's soft factorization and IR divergences for celestial amplitudes. And uh, finally, time permitting, I'll point to a few open questions. Okay, so the first basic thing we want to understand is we want to understand what the variables are that parameterize the celestial amplitudes. And so uh, in particular, we're going to consider a Poincaré constrained four point massless, uh, the four point massless scalar celestial amplitude. Now, uh, we know that Lorentz symmetry uh, is equivalent to global conformal symmetry. And what that tells us is that uh, this four point function can only be a non trivial function of the conformal cross ratio, which can be written in terms of the four points uh, in this way. But uh, the 4D translations turn out to tell us that uh, the four point function is actually only a non trivial function of the real part of the conformal cross ratio and this parameter beta. 
uh, which is related to the sum of the external dimensions of uh, some of the dimensions of the external box. Now we can derive uh, the Poincaré constrained uh, celestial amplitude by, uh, so th this result that I've sort of just summarized uh, by directly transforming the momentum space amplitude. So in momentum space, we know that the two to two massless scalar scattering is, if we constrain it by Poincaré, well, Lorentz symmetry tells us that it can be an on only be a non-trivial function of the inner products of the external momenta. And translations further tell us that actually only two of these um, Male stem invariants are uh, independent. And so, for instance, we can take it to be the center mass energy S in the momentum transfer uh, T and uh, find that Poincare constrains uh, the momentum space to two mass scattering uh, in terms uh, to take this form. Now, if we Mellon transform this, well, the first thing to realize is that the ratio of the two Mandel stem invariants can be identified with the conformal cross ratio. And then, um, since uh, the ratio is identified with the conformal cross ratio, we just introduce the second parameter, uh, omega squared, which is the center mass energy. Uh, so we parameterize the Mandel sum invariance in that way. Now we can take this uh, delta function in momentum space. And as I argued, so this is imposing uh, translation invariance, and translation invariance for one tells us that the conformal cross ratio is constrained to be real. So one of the delta functions has to be this. Uh, delta of z minus z bar. And the other three can be written in terms of ratios of uh, the external energies to the center mass energy. And finally, it's nice to, to rewrite this measure in terms of the center mass energy and then ratios of, uh, the other, of, of other energies. And so what we can see from this is that uh, these three delta functions localize these three integrals. So we perform these integrals and we arrive at the following decomposition. So basically, we have this uh, first part here, which is fixed by kinematics, and, uh, or in other words, uh, ensuring that this celestial amplitude is Poincaré invariant. And then the second part here is uh, encoding the dynamics. And the simple thing to notice is that the dynamics in this, of the celestial amplitude are simply related to the dynamics of the momentum space amplitude by a single Mellon transform, where uh, the parameter in the Mellon transform is beta the sum of the dimensions. Okay, so now we can discuss um, how the effective field theory expansion arises in celestial amplitudes. And to do so, uh, the first thing is to uh, uh, just say a few words about uh, effective field theory expansions in momentum space. So uh, let's begin by considering a particular example. So consider the S channel exchange um, of a massive scalar. Uh, in the sc scattering of four uh, massless scalars. Now, in momentum space, uh, the effective field theory expansion is basically that we can tailor expand uh, in the energy, or in, so in particular, in the center of mass energy. So now we can consider the celestial amplitude that would arise from the leading term. And if we do this, then we notice that you know, it's largely convergent. And in particular, if we take this parameter beta to be imaginary, then we can interpret it as a delta function. But as soon as we try and add uh, the sub any subleading terms to this, it immediately ruins this marginal convergence. You know, namely, it causes the integral to diverge at the upper limit. And so what we're supposed to learn from this is that celestial amplitudes don't really ex exist for now, on the other hand, if you just simply take uh, the full scattering amplitude and perform the Mellon transform, uh, then you find some nice simple result. And uh, so this is just to say that uh, in general, celestial amplitudes are sensitive to UV physics, and uh, there's a drastic difference um, if we truncate the effective field theory expansion uh, versus not. And so in this, in this sense, they really only exist uh, for consistent UV complete uh, theories. And of course, this UV sensitivity is simply a consequence of the fact that we're scattering boost eigenstates, which contain uh, contributions from arbitrarily uh, high energy modes. But then, um, as we just heard about in several talks uh, earlier today, you know, the effective field theory expansion 
contains some very interesting uh, properties, um, especially uh, related to causality. And so there's a question of, can we recover the effective field near expansion directly from celestial amplitudes, or that, is that really just a property of momentum space amplitudes? And uh, or in other words, what is the signature of an effective field near expansion in celestial amplitudes? Now to answer this question, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the effective field theory expansion to approximate the amplitude in the lower range of integration. So you can uh, schematically represent the effective field theory expansion as an expansion in the Mandelstam invariance S and T, which we writing in terms of the conformal cross ratio and some loss energy, we'll take something of this form. Now, if we uh, approximate the uh, amplitude in the lower range of the integration uh, by this expansion, then what we see is that the celestial amplitude should admit simple poles in this parameter beta at negative even integer, uh, at negative even integer. And moreover, the residues of these poles uh, precisely give the coefficients in the effective field theory expansion. So that is to say, we actually can recover these coefficients directly from the celestial amplitudes, and the celestial amplitudes are expected to emit uh, this series of simple poles. And we can verify this uh, explicitly in our uh, example that we considered. So in particular, if we start with the momentum space uh, amplitude, we can tailor expand it and uh, in omega and find this expansion. Alternatively, we can Mellon transform it, obtain this result. And we notice here there are in fact uh, poles, simple poles at negative even integer of beta. And if we take the residues of those poles, we precisely get the, uh, the uh, expansion coefficients uh, in the EFD expansion. Okay, and so the, the next thing that I was going to discuss uh, is uh, the factorization uh, factorization and infrared divergences in celestial amplitudes. And so before, uh, as before, we're going to start uh, with uh, a review of what the story is in momentum space. And so the story there is that uh, if, let's consider uh, momentum space amplitudes in QED with massless charges. And so uh, here, uh, the statement is that the scattering amplitudes factorize into an infrared finite piece and an infrared divergent piece, where the special property is that this, un this uh, infrared divergent piece uh, is uh, universal and takes some simple form. And so in particular, uh, it can be written uh, like this, and that it contains all the infrared divergent. Now, uh, the idea is that we want to uh, sort of understand how this appears and how to think about it in, for celestial amplitudes. And so the first thing to notice is that actually uh, the z-dependence was entirely in terms of these pairwise interactions. And so what that means is that actually we can rewrite the z-dependence as a, a contribution, or we can write this contribution as a two-point function uh, on the 2 d point. And so here, uh, so in particular, this is the, the two-point function. And then what we can do is we can do, use the fact that this infrared divergent factor is entirely involves uh, a pairwise structure to express uh, this, uh, the infrared divergent factor in terms of a correlation function of three fields uh, up to this factor. And we'll see the role of this factor uh, in a moment. Now, what do we gain from this? Well, what we gain is that by writing the infrared divergent factor in this form, we can now actually express factorization as a statement pertaining to asymptotic states. So that is, we can record each moment of asymptotic state as um, some infrared divergent piece uh, and some infrared finite piece. And the interpretation of this factorization is that if we consider, uh, suppose we consider uh, the transformation of this field phi, and suppose we let it transform like the Goldstone boson. Well, under that, then we find that this phase factor uh, transforms in this way, but this is precisely the transformation of a charge Q state under large gauge symmetry. And so what we learned is that under this uh, sort of Goldstone uh, transformation shift of phi, this IR divergent factor is fully capturing the non-trivial transformation of asymptotic particle states, um, under uh, the large gauge symmetry. Okay, 
So now let's see uh, what this implies for celestial amplitudes. And so all we need to do is we need to take this factorized form and perform the Mellon transform. And so here, uh, the correlation function, of course, doesn't depend on the energy, so that just pulls out. And what we see is that we obtain a factorization of celestial amplitudes into an IR divergent piece and an IR a hard piece, which um, simply has the dimensions uh, shifted. So that's what the role of this um, extra omega piece is. And just as a comment, this was actually necessary because uh, these um, vertex operators carry non-trivial conformal weight. So in, for, so in order for the conformal transformation properties of this side of the equation to match the conformal transformation properties of this side of the equation, we actually need to shift the dimension precisely by this amount. Okay, and so uh, the, the last thing to say is that, uh, is to discuss uh, inferred safety. So in momentum space, uh, we have learned that we can obtain infrared safe amplitudes um, by uh, dressing charged particles with clouds of photons. And so in particular, if you have a, a charged state carrying a charge Q uh, and, and momentum PK, then you need to dress uh, the, or you can, you can move the infrared divergences by dressing that charge uh, with a cloud of photons of this form. And here, uh, f is a function which is not specified, but must obey this boundary condition that f of zero is equal to one. Now, if we want to study this uh, for celestial amplitudes, well, it's natural to choose actually a particular form of this function, namely that the function is just equal to one. And the reason for doing that is that if you choose the function in this way, then you can show that this dressing of uh, photons, well, uh, reduces uh, to this form. And what you can uh, notice is that uh, this, um, this well, uh, the photon appears as precisely uh, a photon in a boost eigenstate with boost eigenstate one, with that boost weight one. So in other words, if you choose the conformally invariant dressing, then uh, the dressing involves photons of definite boost weight. Now, um, for those who are very familiar with the story, there's actually two photon modes with boost weight delta equals one. So in particular, there's uh, the generator of large gauge symmetry and its symplectic partner. Now, um, we know, uh, we, or we've understood for a while, that the soft photon theorem is equivalent to a Ward identity for large gauge symmetry. So that means that the soft photons are uh, the generators of, of large gauge symmetry. And for a similar reason as um, studying uh, the uh, implications of the effective field theory expansion in celestial amplitudes, uh, soft photons in momentum space are associated to residues of poles uh, in boost weight space. So that is to say, if we want to scatter, uh, so insertions, uh, so the generators of large gauge symmetry are really the boost eigenstates of photons that are picking out uh, the poles at delta equals one. Okay, so these are the generators. So as I was explaining on the slide, so those are the generators for large gauge theory. But if we actually uh, look back at this delta equals one uh, mode that we found in the dressing, well, we don't we see that it's actually not picking out the residue of pool. It's actually instead something of this form. Now you can show um, using just the standard uh, commutation relations uh, for uh, momentum modes that actually uh, this J, the generator of large gauge transformations, and the delta equals one mode in the dressing are uh, symplectic partners. And therefore you can identify the mode that appears in the dressing uh, with the Goldstone boson. So in other words, the symplectic partner, it's the symplectic partner of the large gauge transformations. And very nicely, you can actually confirm using the wave functions that were found uh, in this paper here, 
that uh, this these are precisely uh, the generator and uh, Goldstone nodes um, that you find uh, from the wave functions, the wave function analysis. Okay, um, so uh, if we uh, return uh, to this right uh, dressing uh, with these eigenstate photons and use the information uh, that this the thing appearing in the exponent can actually be identified with uh, the Goldstone boson for um, a large gauge symmetry, then we find that the dressing with uh, the dressing that removes the infrared divergences is exactly of the form that we found uh, for the correlators that gave rise to the infrared divergences uh, up to this sign. So in other words, the dressing is precisely canceling the IR divergent factor that, was re that we previously found in factorization. And so thus, uh, by dressing with these boost eigenstate uh, uh, photons, we obtain a natural construction of infrared safe celestial amplitudes. And that's because these boost eigenstate photons precisely cancel the IR divergent factor uh, correlation of Goldstone bosons. And so therefore, the dressed celestial amplitudes are equal to the hard ones, where the hard ones were the Mellon transforms of the hard amplitude with these uh, the normalized dimensions. Monica, you have about five minutes. Okay. And okay, so um, now uh, I'm going to explain uh, the story in, in gravity, and it's for the most part precisely analogous with some uh, minor modifications. So Again, in momentum space, it's known that uh, scattering amplitudes uh, factorize into an infrared divergent piece and an infrared finite piece, where again, the infrared divergent piece uh, is universal and uh, can be written uh, in this form. So as before, to understand the implications of this for celestial amplitudes, it's nice to parameterize the energies and uh, the the, uh, the momentum in terms of energies and points in the 2D plane, in which case this infrared divergent factor takes this form. And uh, once again, um, because uh, the sort of z-dependence is only in terms of these sort of pairwise interactions, we can express it um, as a correlation function of uh, three fields. And as before, this allows us to interpret the factorization as a statement between the asymptotic states, where we've identified this factorization as the decomposition um, according to super translation symmetry. So that is, if we take this field, which is reproduced, uh, whose correlation function reproduces the infrared divergent piece, and shift it uh, according to a transformation of the Goldstone boson, then we find that this phase um, also, uh, this, this phase shifts in such a way to reproduce the net and compressible transformation of single particle states under super transitions. And uh, finally, um, uh, so uh, this also implies for similar reasons that uh, celestial amplitudes uh, emit a factorization. And so here, once again, all we do is we take the factorized form in the momentum space and uh, Mellon transform it. And so the only subtlety here is to notice that now these dressings, uh, or sorry, these the infrared divergent pieces uh, involve factors of the energy. And so what that means is that this factorization, this soft part here, is now an operator that acts on the hard part. So in particular, these act on, uh, so act in momentum space, uh, by adding factors of omega, which means they act in boost space space by shifting the dimensions. So this, yes, just to say that the soft component is now an operator uh, for special amplitudes. And uh, so uh, now we can um, obtain infrared uh, safe amplitudes uh, by dressing uh, particles with uh, coherent clouds of gravitons. So this is the particular uh, uh, a cloud that will uh, yield infrared safe scattering amplitudes in momentum space. And once again, by choosing the conformally invariant choice, then we can identify uh, this uh, dressing 
with uh, an exponentiated Goldstein boson and therefore arrive at a similar result where uh, we can have infrared safe uh, celestial amplitudes um, where uh, they are uh, dressed by clouds of uh, gravitons and the dressed ones are equal to the hard, hard celestial amplitudes which are simply obtained by melon transforming uh, the hard uh, momentum space uh, amplitudes. And so uh, the summary uh, uh, is that uh, to begin, I identify the Poincaré constrained for point celestial amplitude from melon primaries. And what we found was that the non trivial dependence of the Poincaré constrained amplitude was really only on the real part of the conformal crash ratio and the sum of the conformal dimensions, uh, which is this beta parameter. And so then we identified uh, the effective field theory expansion that in that the effective field theory expansion implied poles at negative even in the beta. Uh, soft factorization in momentum space is equivalent to a current algebra factorization in celestial amplitudes. And finally, um, infrared safe celestial amplitudes can be obtained by dressing with conformal primary uh, gold stone bosons. And uh, so, I'm going to just point to two open questions, one which is strictly fairly straightforward and the other one which is, I think, quite open-ended and hard. So the first thing is, is that uh, if we want to, you know, there's been some talk in this workshop that it might be interesting and we might learn something by studying higher point uh, celestial amplitudes. And a very basic question is what are the minimum number of variables that, uh, or so in other words, the analogs of this beta and Z for the higher point uh, Poincaré constrained celestial amplitudes. So you already know from the thermal symmetry Sort of what the minimal, what the number of uh, independent conformal cross ratios is, but that tells you there should be at higher points sort of multiple analogs of this data. And so it'd be nice if we sort of knew what that was. And, uh, and to my knowledge, this question isn't worked out. Um, and then the second question was sort of uh, alluded to in this discussion after uh, Simone's talk, which is. Um, there's this idea that right super translation symmetry is telling you that causality in four dimensions is somehow perhaps local on the celestial sphere. It doesn't it, that you know like things super translations can change the causality properties at different points in the celestial sphere. And so I think it'd be really interesting if we could have a precise statement about uh, relating causality in four dimensional scattering amplitudes to some statement about super translation symmetry. So that's it. Thank you very much, Monica, for a great talk. We have now about uh, 10, eight to 10 minutes for questions before we start the panel. So I would ask people to, to raise their hand. Some question, but no microphone. Sorry, Anvalas? There's one question, but it's in the, the chat because there's ah. no microphone. Okay, it's in the chat. Um, Monica, you want to take a look at the chat or should I read it out? Yeah, I can read. So the question is, uh, should one uh, not worry that the IR regulator in background field gauge for gravity might not be ERST invariant? Oh. Um, So, I mean, I guess my feeling is that um, I have it in that context, but then my feeling would be that likewise, likewise you're going to come up with dressings, which perhaps are not BRST invariant, but, you know, they cancel precisely in the, the same precise way, right? Like, um, at the end of the day, the cancellation of IR divergences shouldn't be a gauge dependent statement, a small gauge, like redundant C dependent statement. Yeah. And then the second question is if one wishes to describe common gravity and four dimensional asymptotic class space times using only effective field theory techniques without appealing to CZ slash Trini and physics. Uh, wouldn't 
it be necessary to assume the existence of a fixed UV point. Um, yeah. think, you know, I think the EFT school would say no, right? From effective field theory perspective, you can just sort of build things up, right? Like order by order in momentum space. And you really, you can be agnostic as to what happens in the UV, you know, uh, you don't, yeah, you sort of like don't really care what the endpoint is. You just know that order by order, you include these corrections systematically. Um... Francisco, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, if you would have um, used dimensional regularization in, in, instead of cutoff, uh, you know, an infrared cutoff, everything follows through. I, I wonder because it looks like uh, you have like a regularization scheme that you're following, right? Because you're you're putting a cutoff only for the virtual particles in the loops, but not for the external particles because you when you melt and integrate, you, you integrate all the way from zero to infinity. So is it, is it like a scheme? Okay, so what you described is, is yes, precisely what we did, but also, um, I mean, you can choose, you can choose to regularize the infrared divergence in whatever way you wish. So like, for example, when I showed it in gravity, I actually used dimensional regularization. So, um, um, yes. okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Lorenzo, you put something in the chat. Do you want to make a comment too? No, actually, I was just uh, thinking that uh, uh, the, the problem that was raised, uh, I thought, was uh, really a problem of a cutoff. If you use the MREG, uh, which, of course, is possible, Monica showed it, uh, should be okay. But uh, it's just a guess, actually, I'm not so. Other questions? So maybe I have one. So uh, in the beginning, you showed us that we have these four-point functions, which are meromorphic in the complex boost plane, and you have poles for negative uh, integers, uh, negative even integers for beta. And you had also some, you, you didn't really talk about it, but you had some comments uh, in, the, in your paper about the positive uh, poles to be absent by some sort of resolution that's similar to like uh, the, the resolution of the bulk point singularity in ADS, but now in flat space. Can you maybe comment on? Oh, uh, yeah. So I excluded that because I thought Nina sort of mentioned it, uh, and I didn't want to be too repetitive. But um, yeah. So the idea. Let's see. Maybe it was a good slide. Um, right. So, uh, so. Here, right, I was effectively, um, uh, you know, I, so I assume some behavior of, of the scattering amplitude and expansion of the negative plus zero, and then uh, found some behavior of the celestial amplitude. Now, on the other hand, you might say, uh, you know, there's sort of two expected behaviors. So in QFT, if you look at, so there are expected behaviors for, yeah, omega goes to so in QFT, you think is that the scattering amplitudes, right, uh, you know, uh, fall off with some power uh, of, of uh, energy, and then in a theory of quantum gravity, that instead uh, they're exponentially suppressed um, in energy. And so, uh, if you look at the QFT expect. Uh, expectation, and you essentially do the same argument, but instead you approximate the high energy, uh, the sort of high energy part of the amplitude. Uh, with this QFT expectation, then you'll find that there should also be simple poles um, 
in beta along the positive real axis, whereas on the other hand, if you have this exponential suppression, then you find um, that uh, there are uh, simply no poles on the positive real axis. And maybe just to say that actually uh, in this example, so this would be like a, a QFT example, you see that there are not just poles at negative even integer beta, but there's also poles at positive even integer beta. And so these are the, the, real, uh, the positive real axis uh, poles. Okay, more questions? I think we are coming up on the panel discussion. Okay, so then let's uh, thank Monica for a great talk. And uh, I would ask uh, the panelists, um, yeah, maybe we go again in alphabetical order and maybe I'll stop the recording and then start again.